Hello everyone, uh, my name is uh, Joe Fairhurst and I'm a member of the Baileys of Benahi Community Organisation and I also work at Aberdeen University and I'll talk a little bit about um, both of those. Um, and so this is going to be slightly curated, there's going to be uh, myself for a few minutes, uh, Andrew's going to give an example of the actual research that we're doing uh, here in, in this particular site and then we're going to have our friends and colleagues from Smart History uh, at uh, St Andrews University and they're going to demonstrate um, one of the, the outputs that we've been developing, um, an, app, an app from, uh, from the site. So I've got the timer on so we're going to stick to uh, 20 minutes and it's going to be pretty um, organised. So the, the title, uh, Understand the Stones, Hear the Stories, Relive the Past, comes from our uh, HLF funded project that we've been running this year at the site of the Benahi Colony. This is where we are. Uh, here's a, a nice picturesque shot of the hill in the background there and gives you a sense of the, uh, the landscape that surrounds us at Benihi there. Um, but, but of course, um, part of the idea of the project is that we are in some ways working against these uh, scenic, beautiful images of uh, rural Scotland and actually trying to take a, a slightly more close-grained and... Um, uh, sort of personal look at uh, at the landscape and people's histories of the landscape and, and archaeology has been a really important aspect of that <coughs> but it's actually only one aspect of our broader Benihi landscapes project so so this is the name that we give ourselves um, it's, it's basically a, a sort of segment of the Baileys of Benihi so the Baileys of Benihi is the community group that have been around since uh, the early 1970s 1973 if I remember and they kind of exist as a, as a sort of friends, uh, friends organisation. Um, but we work with partners, long-term partners, such as the Forestry Commission Scotland, who own the land uh, currently, they, they own most of the hill. University of Aberdeen, uh, that I work for as well, uh, Aberdeen to Council, uh, local schools and others, including um, ARCAMS in the past and, and uh, Smart History currently as well. And as I say, we've involved archaeology, uh, archival research, um, all history and natural history as well, so, so geology and uh, wildlife and nature as well. Amongst our funders, well, have been uh, funders of the Benahi Landscapes Project, it's actually been the Baileys itself, so that the Baileys are a membership organisation. It's a, it's a great way to get money for the, to, to kind of generate from within your own membership, and, and of course we can do that because we've been around, or the, the Baileys have been around for um, well, over 40 years now, and so have, have built up that, that really significant um, membership. We, we have had um, uh, funding from academic sources as well, including the Arts and Humanities Research Council, Heritage Lottery Fund as well. Um, and so the, the theme that the Benahi Landscapes Project has worked on um, most over uh, recent years, since it was sort of founded, we started doing the, the Landscapes Project work around uh, 2010, 2011, has been the site of the Benahi colony. This is a, a 19th century uh, informal settlement, crofting settlement, um, that's founded on the hill at a time when it was owned as commonty. And so commonty <coughs> is where land in Scotland is owned in common, but just by the surrounding estates. So um, the estates around the hill um, owned the hill of Benahi itself. They didn't divide it up, but it was understood as being owned by them. And they had um, uh, rights to use the resources, but other people, and certainly in communities around the hill, they felt that they had the right to, to use peat and uh, firewood and, and, and other kind of resources from the hill itself. And so in the 19th century, um, in the context of uh, improvement of the land, um, people started to move to the area and from the local estates, as they were being moved out of the local estates, they started to build their own houses and, and break out fields and build walls and settle on the land as well. And there's a, a brief timeline of, of the, uh, the sort of um, population history of the colony site. And so the key point is that in 1859, the, the land, uh, the hill, uh, is actually divided, sort of physically divided as it were. And the map that you can see on the bottom right there shows the division of the hill, um, of, of the commonty amongst the local estates. And from that point, the, the, 
the sort of settlers become tenants and they have to pay rent and they have conditions imposed on their lease and li- life gets very difficult for them. There are evictions as well and the settlement uh, declines from that point. But what stayed is a sense of the, um, the common heritage and, and in a sense the common ownership of the land even through this history of uh, private ownership. So what the Benahi Landscapes Project has tried to do is give people in the community the opportunity to actually carry out research themselves in partnership with others, um, but, but to really take the lead in carrying out that research. So what I'd like to do now is invite my colleague uh, Andrew Wainwright to talk about um, his research on the quarries of Benahi. And then we'll come back and I'll talk more about the HLF project in a minute. Hello, I'm Andrew. I'm a uh, volunteer member of the Baileys. I'm an ex-farmer. I'm an ex-geologist. So I was asked when they were looking for volunteers to do something for the app, which will come to later, uh, I was asked to look at the quarries. And as usual, I got carried away rather further than I should have done. This is a map of the colony superimposed on a LIDAR image. Uh, LIDAR is fabulous because it will see through trees. It gives you an image, as you can see, like an aerial photograph, but all this area in here where I've been working is totally smothered in, in, in spruce trees. It's, it's pretty tough stuff to walk through, uh, but you can see that the LIDAR will see through it. Uh, these are the main areas where the colonists had their little land holdings, and up here are two little quarries. I've been looking at this southern one here, uh, and this is the map, the first edition of the Ordnance Survey map, dated about 1866. It was probably surveyed a couple of years before that. Uh, this is one of the colony houses with his little fields here, and here is the quarry. And a- as you'll notice, that quarry is, it, it comes right down to the road, it goes back quite a way. It's virtually the size it is now. So it had been worked by 1866, uh, which was during the lifetime of the, comity, of the colony. This is my map of it. Uh, done by triangulation. Unfortunately, it's not facing north as it should do, but it's slightly squint. This is the lower quarry with its spoil heap, and the upper quarry with its spoil heap, uh, and Shepherd's Lodge, which is the local uh, small holding, is here. Interesting thing is you'll see the upper quarry, the spoil heap overruns the dike round one of uh, Alexander Littlejohn's fields. So I would suspect that this quarry was opened up a bit later on after he had been evicted. He was evicted. He reckoned that he had cleared this land by his own efforts. And uh, I think he thought it was kind of unfair to have to pay rent on it. Uh, so he got evicted. Uh, but this is the lower quarry. And that is the lower quarry. It's not awful big. It's about 20 by 20, and I think it's about three meters deep in the middle. So it's not big. Uh, And this shows you one corner of it. There's absolutely no sign of any drilling or explosives or anything used there. They would have used it by the efforts of their own labors. You can see the horizontal jointing in the granite. They would have stuck wedges in there and hit them with bloody great hammers and split it off. Uh, they would take the slabs down to the, the foot of the quarry, and you can see in this stone here, you can see down here, it's easier on the ground, you can see holes that have been punched in it. They put in two bits of steel either side and a wedge in the middle, and they would just bit them alternately, and the tone would slowly change, and then it would suddenly go blip and it would fall apart, and they could trim the stones that way. And very often you can find work stones because they've got this marking on them. People have said that the <clears throat> little quarry there was obviously opened up because the colonists wanted stone to build their houses with. Uh, I don't think that's true at all. Shall I pause a minute? 
No. 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 We're okay. We're okay. All right. We carry on. These stones are not quarry stones. These stones are field stones. That one, look, you can, look the corners are all rounded. Um, all these ones in the back wall are rounded. These up here, they're rounded. Some, like these, have probably been broken. They've probably split some of the bigger stones to make them better for, for building with. But those are not quarry <laughs> stones. Those have been done. And uh, I have heard that there was a thing that if you could build your house in 24 hours, no one could knock it down. So they put these things up pretty quickly. They weren't going to waste time quarrying stone. And anyway, this is a view. Shepherd's Lodge is up in the back there. The quarry is, is in those spruce trees. And you can see here, there's no shortage of stones. They had to clear their land so they could grow crops. They had all the stones they needed for everything. And some of those stones are huge. Um, so I surveyed the little quarry and I reckon that about 500 cubic meters was actually dug out of the ground uh, and about 100, meters, 100 cubic meters ended up in the spoil heap. So 400 cubic meters was exported and that's about 150 tons. Now I have no idea what those things mean. 150 tons is a lot of stone and it was taken out on this little road which is a little wider than that. So it wasn't taken out on big carts, it was taken out on little, little wee carties pulled by one horse, I expect, or one pony. Uh, it was hard work. So, just to put those figures into context, I thought, well, let's look at some of the houses in the neighbourhood. And this is a small cottage. Um, it's pretty typical of the area around there. And as you can see from this end wall, most of these stones are rounded, they're slightly different sizes, they've been trimmed up a bit and there's a lot of scrap between the stones. That's all field stone. The, quarry, the front wall I think is also field stone but they've been treated slightly better and is slightly smarter but I think they're still field stones. The only quarried stones are the lintels to go across the windows and doors and the sills at the bottom, the corner stones up and down the corner of the house. The tabling, which is on the top of the gable ends to keep the rain out. And what's called the spur stone, which is on the corner that stops the, ta stops the tabling from sliding down. So I measured those, and I reckon in that little house, about three and a half cubic meters of stone was used. Uh, and then I thought, well, that's a hell of a lot of, that, that's not much stone to, an awful lot of cottages to build out of that little quarry. So I then looked at a, a slightly bigger one, and believe it or not, this, this, this farmhouse is a lot bigger. So this has got, got four rooms at the bottom, two rooms upstairs, and there's a wing out the back. So it's a much bigger house. It's a much grander house. And the thing that you can certainly see on the ground, but not quite so clear here, this front wall, there's very little variation in the color of the stone. That's all quarry stone, all came from the same place. Um, <clears throat> so you take that into account and the fact that there's a bigger house. I think it's about 25 cubic meters of rock in that house that were quarried. Uh, but I noticed that the steading around the back where the animals were kept, uh, a lot of that is made out of quarry stone, partly because part of it was a mill. And if you think of a great big water wheel trundling around, uh, I'm sure it wasn't desperately well balanced, it would vibrate, it would rattle around. Important that the walls that were holding it up didn't fall down. So that was all quarried stone. So something like 50 cubic meters for the farm as a whole. So there's a lot more. So in conclusion, I reckon this little quarry, that little quarry, produced enough for about 120 small cottages or eight larger farms, or obviously a combination of two. So that sort of puts the output into, into, uh, into context. There are an awful lot more farms around in the neighbourhood, so there must be other little quarries on Benahee that provided the granite. 
Uh, it was almost certainly work before 1866, which was the time that those houses were built. Those are all on the first edition Ordnance Survey map. Uh, and it was probably worked by Alexander Littlejohn, who was the occupier of Shepherd's Lodge, which is the little cottage next door. Okay, thank you. Thanks, brilliant. So, so that's um, an example of the kind of research that, that, we, that we're doing at Benahy that's, that's community-led. Um, and so what we thought for, um, for this year was that we've been doing a lot of this kind of work. We've been doing some excavation, other kinds of archaeology, but we haven't been terribly good at, at telling people about what we've done. So we have produced publications and we've written things, kind of academic things and semi-academic things, again involving and being led by community members. But we wanted to um, engage uh, a broader audience and, and other kinds of groups to what we've managed so far. So um, we secured a grant from the Heritage Lottery Fund to, amongst other things, do um, a digital app and an archive and a website a community promenade drama, and the kale yard and a native woodland. And I'm going to invite um, Ian and Catherine to talk about the app for um, two minutes, uh, if, you can, if you can manage that. So can we... Uh, uh, we're going to do something clever with the technology. <coughs> I'll be very fast. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, cool. So quickly... Um, okay, I got my touch. Just uh, quickly introduce myself, I'm Catherine Cassidy, I'm from the University of St. Andrews and we have a research group out of the computer science uh, department as well as a spin-off company which we've worked with the Baileys now for the past year called Smart History. Um, we're deeply involved in cultural heritage, it's primarily what we, what we work in um, and our uh, products and what we do and cover um, ranges from digital reconstructions based off of archaeological records historical records, maps, um, also drone work, 3D imaging, 3D objects, uh, you name it, kind of, we always try to try to do it. But we, we, we create and um, use these technologies and then produce something and do something with it, which would be for cultural heritage, which through apps, through websites. Um, so right now it's still, as I'll say, it's still um, under construction. We're hoping to release it in the new year. Um, so what you see right now is a cast of the app, um, but just to quickly talk about why the app looks the way it does and why it's a dig digital reconstruction is that the area around um, where, well, where Benahy is, there's a Benahy Center and you're under uh, kind of the face of Mither Tap, which is a very prominent hill in the back, um, is that a lot of people actually go up there um, on the hill, going up the hill, around the hill, running, walking, great for dog walking, just tons of people are going up there and you have the Colony Trail which is underneath um, Mither Tap and what you see is what uh, was in Andrew's slides is the very ruins of these colony houses and there's not too much physical um, notes or physical uh, signs or, or anything telling you while you're there of who lived there, what this was and to give that history of it. So. Um, going off of kind of like a trail-based discovery app that you can explore the map as it was and the, the places and the houses as they looked like in the mid-1800s um, and then with an overlay of the modern uh, path so you know where you are in context. So I'll just open one of these up and see what it is. And this is all based off of um, so digital reconstruction that one of our modelers and historians have been working on with the Baileys, and it's been a whole year so far as a community involvement. Um, so just to give you a little bit of look around. But where you approach this, the landscape looks entirely different as of now. Um, you can see the remnants a little bit. Right here is where there's a gawk stone. Um, so you'll know in reference and in context with uh, modern day to now, or to then, and uh, pop-up information that then brings up information about the area themes that we've associated in with the life of the colonists as well. Let's see. And you can explore it. So I'm I'm quarry one. Just yeah, that. okay. let's see. If I can get into the quarry. So this is just, this is a real time photosphere just of right now. But you can see how small it is. Oh yeah, it's so small. Can you click on any of the... Um, you can get a shepherd's lodge. That's a bit of drone. 
So just helping you see, and you can see about kind of the, the modern path that's there and the, the ruins of where the, um, where the house is. And it helps you see just a little overhead because this was quite an extensive building as well for the colony house. Let's have a look, quick look inside and then we better. Yeah. So in this one, we um, reconstructed inside the house with some objects that we actually digitized through photogrammetry or laser scanning and then brought them back into the context of what the house might have looked like for the colonists, kind of bringing back the human element because a lot of times we see the relics, we see the remains, we see the ruins, and then you kind of disassociate with the people that actually lived there. So we have a nice little, yes, that is a ball. <laughs> I, think, I think we're better. Okay, I'm being kicked off. Cut. Sorry. <laughs> Do you um, want the slides back up? Yeah, can I just have the slides really quickly? Ian, yeah, yeah, tech yeah, person. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so I'm just going to very quickly just point out that um, uh, this is the, how we did the app. We all got together and talked about it and did some workshops uh, on learning the technology. So we actually got those skills of learning this, some of this technology. Um, we also used some of the HLF money to put together a community promenade drama around the colony, which we filmed and are putting into the app itself. Um, and uh, we're actually, rather than putting in interpretation boards, so the whole point was that we weren't going to just put in interpretation boards on the site, we're actually redigging a kale yard, so a croft garden. Uh, we're going to reinstate a croft garden and put a native wood with. Um, sort of foraging wood with apples and fruit and, and nuts and so on around the back of it as well, as a kind of interpretation of the landscape itself. Um, on reflection, what's gone well is that we have reached new audience and new participants. We have learned new skills uh, ourselves as researchers. Um, but what has been hard is moving out of our comfort zone. We're not very good at digital things. We're not very good at thinking about um, apps. And we've probably also bitten off more than we can chew this year as well. But I think what we have shown is that our model of, of um, community-led research in the Benihi landscape uh, project has worked really well.